All right, so we've done a couple of things to show how to increase the gain of an amplifier, and our third approach to increase, including the telescopic cascode and the folded cascode, and our third approach we're going to use is a cascaded approach. We're going to multiply the gain from two stages. So we're going to start looking at a two-stage op-amp. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to take our classic source coupled pair with a current mirror load, and we're going to cascade it into a common source amplifier. So here we'll use a PMOS current source load. Their typical current mirror configuration for the load. We'll use an NMOS tail current source. Of course, we have our differential input, plus minus VID. We're going to set the gate of our tail current source at a constant bias, VB. And we'll label these transistors M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. All right, we're going to take the output of that first stage, and we're going to feed it into a second stage that's going to consist of a common source amplifier, M7. And this is going to be biased with a current source, M6. And we'll use the same bias voltage, VB, to bias this transistor. And we'll control the current that flows through M6 by controlling its size relative to M5. So we'll take the output off of the drain of M7. All right, we've already seen both of these stages numerous times, so we know that the gain is the gain of the first stage. So A total is equal to AV1 times AV2. We've seen both of these circuits before, so we know that the gain for AV1, for instance, is GM12 times the total resistance, which is RO2 in parallel with RO4. And we know that the gain AV2 is equal to GM7 times RO7 in parallel with RO6. So this is AV1 and this is AV2. Now note, I didn't put a sign on either of these. This gain is technically negative. This one could be positive or negative, so the, the sign of the gain could be plus or minus, depending on whether we're using the amplifier in an inverting or non-inverting configuration. Now, one of the problems that we have with this is that we have some capacitance at this node, we'll call C1, and we have some capacitance at this node that we'll call C2. And we're going to see two poles, and both of these poles could be fairly close in frequency if we aren't careful with our design, because C2 is going to be feeding into another stage, likely. We're going to be using this as an amplifier, so it's going to drive a load that might have some capacitance. So C2 could vary, and C1 is going to be relatively constant because it's going to only depend on the transistors. It'll vary a little bit with bias conditions, but it'll be fairly consistent. The problem that we're going to have here is that we have two poles, and if the two poles are too close together, we might see an issue with ringing or stability. And so typically what's done in this situation is we try and make the amplifier, the dominant pole, internal to the amplifier, and the way that they do that is by adding a compensation capacitor between the output and the input of M7, and they call this capacitor CC, the compensation capacitor. And we're going to size this capacitor so that the two poles interact but uh, a little bit, but primarily we're sizing it so that the amplifier is stable regardless of the load that we put at the output. In other words, regardless of whatever this C2 capacitance is. 
Now this is going to cause a problem with slew rate. So before we start investigating the stability conditions of the amplifier, we'll start looking at slew rate in the next set of slides. And what slew rate is, is how fast I can change the output voltage with respect to time. And we're going to see that it has to do with the amount of current that we pump through transistor M5 and the size of the capacitance CC here. Slew rate is typically measured in units of volts per microsecond. So how many volts can we change the output per microsecond in time? And we'll look at that in the next set of slides.